<laughs> Welcome everybody to the uh, April meeting of the Northeast Philadelphia History Network. My name is Jack McCarthy. I'm the president of the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History. We are the organization, the Friends, that sponsors the meetings of the network. The way we communicate with everybody is through our Facebook page and through an email list, a listserv. So there's a sign-in sheet going around. If uh, Please sign in. If you're not on our email list, please put your email on there and we'll add you to the list. So between the Facebook page and the emails, that's how we communicate with everybody. And we meet here the first Wednesday of every month, except for July and August. We've been doing it for 10 or 12 years now, I think. So um, for upcoming meetings, we have next uh, month, May, what is that, May? Bert, what? May 3rd. Um, Patty McCarthy will be giving a talk on the history of Tarsdale and the Morelton Inn. And the Morelton Inn was this uh, really fashionable, exclusive club where the rich and powerful of Philadelphia would socialize and congregate. It, it sort of became the, the focus of Tarsdale, but it's a, uh, a lecture on the history, early history of Tarsdale and the Morelton Inn. It's a really fascinating story. So that's gonna be uh, May 3rd. And then, for our June meeting, we usually have a site visit to a historic location in Northeast Philadelphia. And we're happy to report that we're going to be meeting at the new GAR Museum and Library in Holmesburg. Uh, the GAR for many, many years was in Frankfurt. They recently moved to Holmesburg. So we're gonna be having uh, tours of their new facility. And I think we're meeting at 6.30 for that, not seven o'clock, but we'll send out uh, details uh, on all that. So um, that's May and June, and then we take off uh, for July and August. And um, a note that the last month's program on the Boy in the Box, which was of great interest to many people, is available on our YouTube channel. You go to uh, the Northeast Philadelphia History Network YouTube channel, and you can see that entire program uh, and actually all our programs are on YouTube, uh, except for one or two that the speakers rather not be recorded, but uh, almost all of our programs are up there if you ever uh, miss anything. Um, as always, please join us for refreshments and networking and socializing after the talk. Uh, we have some great food uh, this month. And um, I guess without further ado, did you wanna, about the penny pack? I just want to uh, welcome everybody to Penny Pack Baptist Meeting House, built in 1805. We've been meeting here, as Jack said, for about 10, 11, almost 12 years. Uh, Penny Pack, the Meeting House is getting old, has been old since about 1810. And uh, it's we're doing some renovation. We just got the Palladian windows. When I say we, I'm with the Penny Pack Baptist Historical Foundation. Uh, the foundation and the church, which is still active, the Pennypack Baptist Church is active and has been active for 300 and will be celebrating its 335th anniversary on June 4th. We've been doing some re renovations, getting some state grants to uh, fix, well, we started with a Palladian window in the front there, did a beautiful job on that, a fellow named Jim Christensen. And then we applied, that was about two, three years ago. Well, it started three years ago. It was completed last year. Uh, now we are going to do the front doors so that that will complete the entire front. We'll get the soffit painted and that uh, lower center window. We've uh, applied a, for a grant for that. And I hope to hear on that in June and the work could possibly start in October. Another thing that we're looking to do is remove these big, blower boxes up here on either side that's the air conditioning system and the heater system hvac uh which is uh on its last legs so we included that in the grant as well and we're going to go with many split systems many split system uh, which will eliminate those and be a much more efficient uh, system where the heaters and air conditioners will be along the wall here three on each side 
So we're looking forward to that. So, uh, but uh, we can always use money. We're, this is a 50-50 grant. Uh, so we need to come up with 50% of the uh, of the cost. Uh, so we can uh, certainly use any help that uh, people can give us on that. But we do appreciate Pennypack Baptist Church for having us here for these many years. And we look forward to continuing our relationship with Pennypack Baptist. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fred. And uh, Fred sort of is on both boards of the, 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 the church here and the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History. So, and we are very grateful to Pennypack Baptist for hosting us. It's a really perfect venue in so many respects. Um, so uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, those in the audience, we're going to, we have, as I said, new technology. We have a couple of handheld microphones that we're going to hand out so that when you ask a question, uh, it'll be heard both here and also out in Zoom land. Uh, people on Zoom, if you would continue to put your questions in the chat box, we will read them at the conclusion of the program and have, have the speaker answer them uh, that way. So those in the audience will ask verbally and those uh, in Zoom, we uh, will answer your questions via the chat box. And again, if you're on Zoom, please stay muted the entire time. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Harry Garforth, who is a retired uh, longtime SEPTA and Amtrak employee and a uh, radio, uh, radio. <laughs> No career. Wrong industry. <laughs> a, a railroad uh, historian and author. Uh, and uh, he gave the first part of this talk back in December. And this is part two, the Frankfurt L and his predecessors. So uh, welcome, Harry Garfield. Thank you. Good evening. Can everybody hear me both online and uh, in, the, in the room here? Everybody good? Okay, good. So welcome everybody. Um, I just wanted to say, as Jack mentioned, there was a, a part one. And for those people that are online, uh, you do have an opportunity to go back and look at that program. It has been archived as Jack mentioned. So if there's something <clears throat> that you're interested that isn't talked about tonight, it might've been covered in the first part of the program. And actually the content of that program uh, brought rail transportation from 1835, 1832, all the way up to the week that the uh, Frankfurt Elevated opened up. So that's where we're going to pick up tonight. But if you're interested in things like the Philadelphia and Trenton Railroad or the Philadelphia and Frankfurt Railroad, it was probably covered in that presentation. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the Frankfurt Elevated and its 100 years of operation. Before I get started, I just wanted to mention, as you can see, we, we did do a book uh, to commemorate the 100th anniversary uh, in conjunction with the Historic Society of Frankfurt. If you're interested in the subject matter that we covered tonight, um, we do have books available for a donation of 25 hours to the Historic Society of Frankfurt, and they're available after the program this evening. So tonight, we're going to talk about the Frankfurt's Elevated Railway, Part 2, 100 Years of Service. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have a question for Fred. Fred? Yes. I'm seeing everybody that's online, and it's actually blocking uh, my view of the notes. <laughs> I can minimize that. Never, never mind. I fixed it. I fixed it. Okay, so that, and I got to be careful because my volume's uh, up. Um, the first thing I want to do is express appreciation and recognition for all the different sources of material that was uh, donated and offered uh, for this effort tonight. Yeah, this one, we're good. We're good. Sorry. Uh, for this uh, effort tonight, uh, for the two programs, part one and two, and of course the book. So uh, there were a lot of um, great pictures that were uncovered in this effort, and I just want to uh, say thank you to them. So tonight we're going to be talking about the Market Frankfurt line, but the Frankfurt section 
from the Frankfurt Transportation Center that we know it of as it is today down to Spring Garden Street. And starting in November 20, uh, 1922, the Frankfurt Elevated and the Bustleton Trolley Line, otherwise known as Route 59 today, opened and were, were completed and a week long celebration ensued thereafter. Service began and ran for 100 years of, of operation. There were feeder routes that uh, were created and fed the Frankfurt Elevated at numerous stations using different forms of transportation. And we'll talk about that tonight. And then over a hundred years, of course, you're gonna see refreshment of equipment. So we'll talk about that as well. And then of course, after a hundred years, uh, time uh, wears on a structure like, like the elevated steel structure and it had to be rebuilt. So here we are, uh, the, the structure has been completed, everything's in place and it's time to celebrate the completion of the elevated and its opening. And you got to understand that the Frankfurt community withstood uh, many, many years of disruption during the construction. So they're celebrating that as well as the opening of the line. And you see some uh, more well-to-do uh, residents of Frankfurt uh, coming out in their horse-drawn carriage. Others uh, came out with just wearing their hat which seems to be uh, not optional in this particular photograph. Some of the individuals that were on the carriage actually joined the people in this, in this portrait. During the celebration, one of the original horse cars was brought back out, rehabilitated, and inserted into the parade up Frankfurt Avenue during the ceremony. And uh, Thomas Castor was one of the individuals that was credited with uh, developing uh, a horse car of this design. The car itself seems to have been preserved at least for a year after the elevated opened up, but I, I don't recall hearing where that car might be today. If it's in any museum, um, we're not aware of it. So to celebrate the, uh, the opening, many speeches were given up at Bridge Street. And in the previous presentation, we saw construction of this large beam in the left-hand photograph where people are standing uh, in front of the Frankfurt cars looking down onto the speaker's podium. That 68-ton beam is now being used as an observation deck for the event. The speakers included Mayor Moore, uh, William Twining, and possibly Thomas Mitten. Now here we have uh, something that uh, it just dawned on me today and I've talked with uh, Susan uh, several times about this photograph on the left and it appears to be um, a 1922 version of photoshopping. Uh, I've recently found out that the dummy building, dummy depot building in uh, Frankfurt on Oxford Avenue uh, was no longer standing as of November, 1921. And here we see uh, the uh, Bernie car for the Bustleton trolley is posed in front of what we think is that building, but it's not really there. On the right, you see a bronze plaque that was uh, mounted in the Hammonds building up at Bridge Street to commemorate the uh, completion of the elevated. That, that plaque, unfortunately, is also missing. It was there up until the Frankfurt Transportation Project, um, but then it was stored and somehow it disappeared. Okay, on November 3rd, a couple of days before service commences, when was the last time you saw Bridge and Pratt with just one person standing on the platform? We're waiting for service to start, as well as the cars. They're all ready to go. And here's a comparison of what Frankfurt Avenue looked like between Pratt Street and Bridge Street when it was trolleys only. And I call your attention to this building here that was the transportation building for the trolley depot. And there's that same building after the elevated opened up. The car in, in the foreground here is a Hog Island car. It is not set up to run with uh, multiple unit operation, but it is set up to haul a trailer. And we think that this car, since it was rare to see this type of car up in the Frankfurt area, was used to bring the company officials up to the speaking engagement. 
So we're going to cover 100 years of the Frankfurt Elevator. And that means a lot of things happened. And we're going to walk through these things through the program tonight. You, I'm not asking you to absorb them all at this point, but they are all important. They are all important uh, activities that really took place during the year that had an impact on the Frankfurt L, as well as the Route 59 and the Route 66, as we'll discuss later. So as you move into the 50s, you'll see that uh, vehicles are being replaced. Expansion of facilities is being undertaken. By 1960, the bug cars arrive. And then uh, in 1977, there was a large project to uh, build I-95 affecting Fairmount uh, Station and uh, the right of way along Front Street. And then into the 70s and 80s, you see fleet renewal, reconstruction of the elevated, and uh, new cars coming in 1999 and finally in 2022 we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the frankfurt elevator so let's go back in time and start forward from 1922 and this is uh, very interesting and you say well why were we talking about the delaware river bridge well if you look over here where the cursor is there's there's a trolley that's positioned in this postcard view on the bridge so it was planned actually to operate trolleys across the bridge. And just below that, you see there's another rail type vehicle running on the outside of the cables, and that was rapid transit. So there were two elements of rapid transit planned for the bridge that weren't in service when the bridge opened up. Now, we've always talked about these trolley cars running on the bridge, but I've never seen evidence until recently that they had installed trolley tracks on the bridge. So this was a new discovery for me. The bridge had a huge impact on the Delaware Avenue Elevated. Delaware Avenue Elevated was constructed in 1908. It was uh, an extension of the Market Street Subway Elevated, and it ran north on front to a 180 degree uh, turn to reach Delaware Avenue. And it served two stations on Delaware Avenue at ferry terminals. But you can see in this view, its future is uh, sort of darkened by that uh, bridge in the background because travel will start to shift to the bridge and off the elevated. And sure enough, in 1939, the Delaware Avenue elevated is retired. Now, uh, another uh, contributing factor to that was in 1936, those tracks on the outside of the cable line on the bridge were uh, placed finally into service and used for the Camden Bridge Line. So that also contributed to the siphoning of passenger trips off the Delaware Avenue elevated. You can see how sharp that curve was. It's 180 degree off of, uh, turn off of uh, Front Street on the Delaware Avenue. And of course the Frankfurt elevated is running up this way. And this was the junction that was created at Front and Arch Street when the Frankfurt elevated opened in 1922. The ferry service continued until 1952, even though the elevated wasn't running. Uh, there was a bus that was uh, placed in the service connecting to the L at uh, 2nd and Market Street that did serve the ferry terminals up until the closure in 1952. So some of the changes that occurred to the Frankfurt elevated, we looked at them briefly earlier. In 1942, there were wartime adjustments to maximize car fleet use and uh, to address the lack of power, lack of, lack of traction power being generated by the substation up at Arick Street. And so to uh, alleviate the strain on that substation, they started turning every other train back at Erie Tarsdale during the war. In 1948, a new terminal opened up at Arick Street, and we'll talk about that in greater detail. A new lateral platform was added at Brick Street to handle the passenger volume it was now being, uh, was an outgrowth of the doubling of service that occurred once the Delaware Avenue elevated was discontinued because every other train used to go down to South Street while the junction was in service. Once the Delaware Avenue elevated was closed, all trains ran through to Frankfurt, of course, except for World War II when they had that power problem. In 1956, there was a new depot, uh, a bus depot built at Frankfurt uh, to uh, manage the uh, delivery of a thousand new buses 
And then also a new escalator was added at the Bridge Street Terminal. And then the AB skip stop service was also introduced then. And then in 1960, we, we know about the Frankfurt L cars being delivered and we'll talk about that. So here's the wartime uh, service adjustments that we talked about with every other train turning back at Tarsdale. And it was a slight inconvenience, but since they couldn't get the uh, material necessary to upgrade the power supply during the war effort, uh, this lasted for a short while. In addition, Route 73 uh, trolley service was restored in June, uh, June 1943. It had been suspended uh, earlier in August of 1941, but the uh, track and the wire was still in place because Route 15 uh, originated out of Frankfurt Depot and they needed a way to, uh, to get to the uh, depot to the Route 15. So all that trackage and overhead stayed in service and 73 could use it for a quick resumption of bringing employees to the Frankfurt Arsenal. Here's the new lateral platform that was added in 1952 up at uh, Breach Pratt. It allowed trains to uh, turn quicker. Uh, passengers could be offloaded onto the new platform while the doors on the left side of the consist were open and boarded from the island platform. And another motor would board the train at the opposite end and the, and the train could exit the station quickly. Things like this had to be done because there was a large growth in ridership. You started seeing a lot of uh, additional passenger growth as uh, development occurred beyond uh, the Frankfurt Elevated and all these feeder routes that were upgraded as the Elevated uh, continued to run. What was being used up at uh, Frankfurt were trolleys. And here you see a, a Peter Witt car uh, being used to provide service on um, Route 3. And one of the few routes that, that saw uh, PCC cars up in this area is the Route 5. And you can see that car is waiting for passengers before its departure down to South Philadelphia. Now, all those trolley routes were converted to rubber tired vehicles in a fairly short period of time. There were a few outliers, but in starting in earnest in 1948, during the next eight years, nine routes would be converted to either bus or trackless trolley operation. And you can see uh, if any of you were here for the earlier program, I talked about Lehigh Avenue Bridge and how it needed to be a clear span to allow trolleys turning off of Lehigh Avenue onto Kensington. And I found a car, a picture of a car doing exactly that. And so I thought I'd point that out tonight. We talked about Frankfurt Depot, and this is the two views that were um, captured, one with it uh, being a trolley facility. You can see there's, there's no buses in that picture, but now, in 1956, there's nothing but buses and a brand new bus support depot. Mm. Up at uh, Bridge Street, they had to put an escalator in to expedite passenger movement through the terminal. And then at the same time, we talked about the uh, AB skip stop service was introduced in 1956. Now there's Frankfurt cars that were delivered in 1922. Um, they were state-of-the-art at the time, and they performed heroically. But by 1960, you had a serious situation where you had 1907 cars that were built for the Market Street side of the Market Frankfurt line. And um, these cars were all starting to get uh, to their useful life point. So uh, new cars were when it be ordered. However, in the case of the Frankfurt cars, they weren't done. As you can see in this picture on the right, some of the cars were uh, retained for use on the revenue train and work train service. So they started a second career. So here comes the new L cars. And close by here, we're at the Busselton and Welsh Road. I recently was uh, showed this picture. Someone shared it with me and I said, I have gotta get that in the program tonight. So here it is coming down from the Bud Red Lion plant to Philadelphia as the first car to renew the Frankfurt Elevated Mark and Frankfurt Line fleet. And here are the new cars. Uh, this is more promotional, 
material, which showed that the 270 cars were purchased to replace the 315 older cars. And this is a posed picture, but uh, it looks uh, quite refreshing. There was a dedication of the new cars up at Breach Pratt Station with Mayor Richardson Dilworth in attendance. And I call your attention to this new truck design, which was lightweight and allowed these cars to accelerate quite quickly as opposed to the other cars that they replaced. Unfortunately, uh, they accelerated quite quickly around the York Street curve and, and uh, sustained a derailment in 1961. I believe I was in around December of 1961. And of course, busing uh, was introduced to uh, pass, get the passengers around that uh, situation until the repairs could be made and service restored. So let's talk about 59. 59 was a companion project to the Market Frankfurt, sorry, the Market the Frankfurt Elevated Project. And it went through a, a serious passenger growth situation of its own. And it actually was quite starved for capital. It was intended to be a two track, higher capacity uh, surface rail line that was to operate not only to Bustleton, but all the way up to a point at uh, the Byberry Hospital in Southampton Road next to the Boulevard. And it was supposed to be two tracks at its entire length. It was not. It was open as mostly a single track route. It had short stretches, stretches of double track, both in the Frankfurt area and then up in the Pusselton area. But it was a lot of single track and, and limited passing sidings, which uh, really is a, an operating uh, challenge for, for trying to carry passengers as passenger growth starts growing quickly. Uh, the first problem was the number of cars that they purchased and the type of cars they purchased. The city of Philadelphia bought five Bernie cars, which only sat 33 passengers. Uh, they soon had to be supplemented with other cars from the PRT. Um, then they wanted to operate more frequently. Once they got larger cars, the next step is to start running more frequent service. Double track had to be added. More sightings had to be added. And then in 1942, they double track right through Oxford Circle, which is kind of interesting because before that, uh, all service had to operate through a single track on the northern leg of that circle. In 1948, there was a, a significant change in the Arrick Street Transportation Center as we know it today area. Uh, and that also forced a route cut back to Cotman Avenue while work was being done on Castor Avenue between Cotman and Bell's Corner. And that was in preparation of uh, trackless trolleys being introduced in 1950. And BTC actually invested $1 million on the Arrick Street terminal improvements. So here's the small cars that I was describing. That's called the Bernie car. It sees 33 passengers and it's sitting at Bustleton a lot, which was the end of the first segment that did get built. You can see the difference in the size of the car to the right, which is a larger double end car and increased uh, seating capacity by 50% and, and standing room even further. The double tracking through Oxford uh, Circle is shown here on the left, and that was a major improvement. In 1948, Route 59 was truncated at Cotton Avenue, and Route 59 bus uh, was started to uh, provide service to the Bustleton community. And then in order to commemorate the last day of rail operation to Bustleton, the Philadelphia chapter of the NRHS chartered a trolley, and they actually got one of the original Bernie cars and ran trips up and down the Route 59 that day until uh, their picture on the right and the upper right is a picture of that same car derailed off the track. And it's, it's tied up the line. There's four uh, revenue cars all tied up behind that car until they could get it back on the track. But I guarantee, guarantee you it did get back on the track and it continued on its way. So, what happened down at Arrett Street? Well, what, what is interesting about Arrett Street is today we know it as a um, westbound street, but it was really originally an eastbound street. And Orthodox was actually originally a westbound street and it became an eastbound street. So 
that was a major change that had to be taken uh, into account. So the city of Philadelphia was very much involved in this uh, project. But before that, you had three bus routes that actually terminated on Overington Street, where the P bus used to stop up until recently. And so you had the route J, the route K, and the route P, all using Overington Street as a bus terminal. And here's the change in direction that I was describing. Uh, before 1948, Barrett Street was eastbound, Orthodox Street was westbound. So here's, here's how it looked with the 75 cars uh, picking up passengers on Arrett Street heading over to Port Richmond. And there's the dummy depot in this older picture. Thank you, Susan, uh, showing Arrett Street. And you're looking west up towards uh, Castor Avenue in that view. There's another 75 car coming eastbound underneath the uh, Philadelphia Reading, Reading Railroad, uh, Frankfurt Branch at the Arrett Station. So here's after the change, okay? Be part of that uh, uh, street direction change was the conversion from trolleys to trackless trolleys. And uh, now you can see that trackless trolleys are sitting, actually they're sitting on Orthodox Street. If you look closely to the caption of this picture, it says Route 75 trackless trolleys are abandoned on east of Frankfurt on Margaret Street. Now they're not abandoned, they're actually waiting for passengers transferring off the L and they're sitting on Orthodox Street. So truth and in, in, in journalism uh, didn't exist uh, before today either. Um, the other element of Route 75 was the use of private right-of-way between Adams Avenue and Wyoming Avenue, which expedited trips. And we know it today as Ramona Avenue, and that wasn't converted until after Route 75 was converted to trackless operation in 1948. Up at Arrett Street, you can see there were uh, significant changes with the street direction being uh, reversed. Now you have, uh, you have Route J coming into the terminal. You have Route 59, which has been uh, looped through the terminal. And that involved uh, the city of Philadelphia funding the installation of track on Penn Street, which up to this point didn't exist. So for 59 to be able to get back to Oxford after looping through the Arrett Street terminal, they ran on this trackage over Penn Street to reach Oxford. And that's a 1949 view. And of course in 1950, we went trackless. So here's what that loop looked like. It came around a very sharp curve up Barrett Street, out Penn Street, and then back out to Oxford Avenue. And here's kind of what that lo uh, looks like today. Uh, there's the uh, substation for the, um, the elevated and Route 59, and there's a Route K bus waiting to depart. So the city of Philadelphia invested in, in trackless in 1949, and I'm not sure why they came in 49, other than maybe there was some delay in the street construction on Castor Avenue or other components. But the coaches arrived in 49, lettered for the city of Philadelphia. They, they were stored, they had to be stored somewhere. So they were stored down at Southern Depot where there was other trackless, trackless routes operating. But by 1950, the service began. Route 59 was extended up to Bell's Corner over the renewed and widened Castor Avenue. And you can see at Bell's Corner, there's a brand new trackless uh, waiting to pick up passengers for its trip down to uh, Arrett Street. Here's the brochure that was issued to the passengers explaining these changes. And here's that addition of the route from uh, Cotman Avenue up to Bell's Corner. And then at that same time, once that extension occurred, the Route 59 bus ran up Bustleton as opposed to coming across Cotman to make the connection with the trolley. Now, this is something interesting that I wasn't aware of. When the city bought these coaches in 1950 or 49, I should say, um, they had a large 59 placed on the right rear corner of those coaches. Now, why would they do that? Well, because of their reorientation of Arrett Street, 
you had two trackless routes now using that particular wire. You had the 75 coming across from uh, Port Richmond, and then you had the 59s looping around off of Oxford. So if you were coming, transferring off the elevator and approaching the coach from behind, you wanted to know if that was your coach. And that's the purpose of that 59. So I want to talk about 66 for a while. And, and you might question, well, why are we talking about 66? How is that related to the Frankfurt elevator? Well, uh, as we discussed in the first part of the program, the Frankfurt Elevated was planned to be extended all the way up to Ron Street. Unfortunately, that never happened, but 66 took on that role as a feeder route for Frankfurt residents or residents along Frankfurt Avenue to reach the elevated and make the transfer at Great Street. Now, when the elevated opened up in 1922, the PRT did not even uh, operate service on Frankfurt Avenue beyond Great Street. So in 1926, they acquired the, the hop toting frog that we talked about in, in part one, which is the Holmesburg, Taconi, and Frankfurt uh, Street Railway. They took over, uh, designated it as Route 66 January on January 2nd of 26, and they started using larger equipment on those cars. Before then, there was a, a mishmash of different cars being operated on the two routes that the hop toting frog had the rights to run. In 1927, uh, Route 26, uh, 66 got moved into the terminal. 1945, there was a new loop uh, built and opened at Greg Street to facilitate, to facilitate turnbacks. And then in 1955, uh, there was a conversion first to bus and to trackless trolleys uh, for the future. Here's a, <laughs> here's a hop toad and frog car. I uh, remember when it used to snow. Uh, this is uh, this is a long uh, state road, and this was one of the two routes that the hop toad and frog ran. Um, this particular route uh, did not continue on as a rail operation. It was converted to uh, bus route T, but the uh, the trolleys continued to operate on Frankfurt Avenue. And I'm not sure what the story was with this one particular car that was lettered for the Frankfurt, Taconi, and Holmesburg because we've never found evidence of that car operating on that particular line. So now we've seen that the, the loop operation is, is going into effect. Um, the Frankfurt <laughs> Avenue route became Route 66, the State Road route became Bus Route T. And this is the uh, extent of operation. It ran all the way out Frankfurt Avenue to city line, uh, the city line uh, boundary with Bucks County. Here you can see the loop operation that was in effect. It went counterclockwise. And that seemed to be okay. And it worked pretty well with uh, you know less traffic on Frankfurt Avenue than we have today. But eventually, when they started to uh, try to exit the loop and, and cross southbound Frankfurt Avenue traffic, it became a little bit more difficult as time went on. And we'll talk about what they did to uh, resolve that. Here you see 66 is at the end of the rail operation. The trackless trolley wires have been installed, and we're about to convert from uh, trolley to bus temporarily and then to trackless. The far end of the route uh, ended at close to the city line at a stub end terminal, which required the use of these double ended cars, even though they eventually had a loop at Bragg Street and they had the loop down at uh, Bridge Street. Uh, when all cars came up here, they needed to be double ended. And here you can see a connection that is established with the Neat Bauer Bus Company. That bus company replaced the trolley service that ran into Bucks County up until 1932. And there was a lot of through service. In fact, there were uh, some plans talked about even before the PRT took over uh, the Frankfurt, Taconi and Holmesburg in 1926 about running a consolidated service between Breach Street all the way up to Marsville. Unfortunately, that did not occur. Here's your conversion that goes from trolley to bus. And we, why did they bus? Well, they bus because they were changing the overhead wire from trolley operation to trackless, plus they needed to install a number of poles 
uh, for a couple of different reasons. One for cutbacks that were instituted with the trolley operation. And they also, uh, at that time, I believe, built the uh, substation out at the Greg Street Loop. Now, here's what they did to address the uh, direction of traffic for Route 66 in, in the Bridge Street Terminal area. Uh, up until 1955, it was a counterclockwise loop. And after the trackless and bus, actually the, starting with the bus and then the trackless, in uh, 1955, it went to clockwise. But instead of coming back over to Frankfurt Avenue immediately, they used Busselton and then a right turn on Sheltonham to come up to a signalized intersection where they could cross over to the northbound lanes of Frankfurt Avenue. The L didn't always run. There were times uh, when the, the union and management did not agree on contract terms and there were interruptions. Uh, so whenever that happened and it, it occurred frequently because the contract uh, terms were usually about two years, uh, passengers were uh, uh, asked to fend for themselves. And here they are standing at Frankfurt Junction Station waiting for the next inbound Trenton train. And you can see that Frankfurt Junction was not set up to handle this volume of passengers. So in 1964, uh, things were changing. Uh, SEPTA was created. At this point, it wasn't an operating agency, but it was intended to take over the PTC, the Red Arrow system out in, in the suburbs and eventually the frontier system in Norristown. And so in 1968, it did actually take over the direct operating control of the PTC. And you can see that the appearance of the buses didn't change much on the left. Uh, all those buses are SEPTA buses and they have a sticker placed on top of the PTC wing. Eventually SEPTA did start overhauling the equipment. And you can see on the right, there's uh, a similar type painted in the, a fresh red, white, and blue paint scheme. Now in 1976 and 77, I mentioned that the uh, PennDOT project to build I-95 into the northern, uh, into, uh, from the north into center city Philadelphia required major changes to the elevated. Not only that, they had to somehow maintain service during that project. So a, a, a temporary trestle was uh, constructed to uh, move the elevated operation around the construction site. And on the right, you can actually see that uh, there is an elevated train running on the old right of way while the construction is going on underneath it. The two car train down below is being used to test the signals and third rail. And I think I believe clearance is on the new alignment. And as part of that project, uh, Fairmount station was closed and a new station was opened up between the northbound and southbound lanes of I-95 and I guarantee you any passenger waiting for an elevated train at that location uh, does not miss their train because the roar of the traffic is, uh, is really tough. In 1979, it was time to replace all those tracklesses that were acquired starting in 1948 all the way through 1955 for the Northeast trackless routes. And AM General uh, supplied the vehicles. There was 110 in this particular order. They were air conditioned. So they were a welcome addition to the operation of service in this area. 10 came with wheelchair lifts. And these coaches, uh, a portion of the 110 coaches were used for the two South Philadelphia tra trackless trolley routes, 29 and 79. So the condition of the Frankfurt Elevated did not uh, fare well. In 1986, a study was undertaken to assess the condition of the Market uh, Street subway elevated, as well as the Frankfurt elevated. And, and it, unfortunately, the Frankfurt elevated needed attention first, even though it was built 15 years later. So a project was developed uh, with a budget of seven, $760 million to rebuild the 5.2 mile long elevated over a 10 year span. They used concrete precast deck decks installed, but the bents were surprisingly uh, found to be reusable. And so they just modified them and re reinforced them. Direct fixation of track was utilized and station, uh, station replacement effort was also uh, undertaken to modernize the uh, Frankfurt Elevated. One of the stations that did not change very much was Tioga. 
And as you can see in the picture on the right, which I took uh, recently, uh, it doesn't look much different than it did in 1922. The interesting part is I strayed 10 feet from my car to take this picture. And within that 10 feet, I met a Doberman Pinscher. I, I saw a drug deal go down and I got propositioned. So air conditioning, uh, air conditioning is hard to come by in the Northeast. Uh, the Mark of Frankfurt order that came in 1960 was not air conditioned. Ironically, a hundred cars were in that order were and had modifications that could facilitate air conditioning, but it was never acted upon. Car 614 was the only car that actually received air conditioning as, a, as an effort to assess the cost and complexity of the project. And that's as far as that uh, project ever went. So in order to address the need for new equipment, in 1999, new cars came built by Adtrans. They were air conditioned. And it was a, a, a refreshing addition to the Frankfurt Elevated and the Mark Street subway. These cars uh, boasted air conditioning, soundproofing, audio visual announcements for the next station, external announcements on the platform. So you could uh, know what the train was when it arrived, whether it was an a, B, a train or a B train when they were operating. It had regenerative braking to save energy costs. There were 222 cars that were in this uh, contract with wider doorways. Now, if you notice the number of cars is going down, uh, we started out with 315 cars uh, with the 1922 uh, startup of the Frankfurt Elevated. Then we went down to 270 blood cars in 1960, and now we're down to 222 cars in this latest order. It's still uh, set this uh, highest volume route in its network. So it's still uh, continuing to play the major role that it had always played, but with fewer vehicles. AC propulsion was also used in traction control. Now, just like the Frankfurt cars, the 1960 bug cars uh, did not go quietly. The Narstown high speed line was suffering from a shortage of equipment around that time that they were being required. So, uh, some effort was undertaken to see if these cars could be uh, shifted over to the Nars Down High Speed Line. Now, those of you who are familiar with track gauges in the audience, you're going to say right away, well, well how's that going to happen when the Nars Down High Speed Line is standard gauge, which is four feet eight and a half, and the, NAR, and the Frankfurt Elevated was five, two and a quarter, or five, two and a half, depending on who you talk to. So, what was done? They found out that these cars were being retired by path. And they did run on four foot eight and a half gauge track because they were part of an actual railroad system. And you can see this car has a keystone on it. So that was part of the uh, PRR owned operation, uh, the Hudson and Manhattan line. And those cars were being retired at the same time. So they were able to use the truck assemblies from these cars under the uh, blood cars and provide interim service until new equipment could be ordered for the Norristown high speed line. So we're getting close to the end. It's 2001 and the Frankfurt Transportation Center project begins. Now, this is a major, major project because number one, the uh, Frankfurt Elevated is not going to Ron Street. So it doesn't have to be uh, over to up of Frankfurt Avenue. It's actually going out of its way before it gets into the uh, complex to store cars and maintain cars. So they took the facility and they moved it off Frankfurt Avenue so it was more in a direct line to the yard and reducing curvature. It created accessible paths for passengers transferring between buses, trackless, and the Market Frankfurt line. And that was a major achievement, believe me. I drove a bus out of uh, bridge, uh, Frankfurt Terminal, uh, Frankfurt Depot, and I, I don't know how I never did it, but uh, you know, you always, came out of the depot looking right, left, right, left, right before you, you got to your, uh, your pickup point because people were walking all over the place. Um, so it eliminated the conflicts between transit vehicles and pedestrians. And then parking was addressed. Parking was addressed by adding a thousand spaces in a structured parking facility. And that helped things immensely. And there was also an, empl uh, an employee parking area that was built off street 
and that eliminated the conflict between the residents who, who competed with the operators for their spots on the street every day. And it also took some parking off the street to allow better flow of transit vehicles in and around the Frankfurt Terminal Complex. And what a change. Here you look in, in 1948 and it's just uh, claustrophobic. The L seems to be right on top of you. There's no sunshine. And now on the right, you see it's all opened up to the sky. And, a, and it's quite a significant change. And people who walk on Frankfurt Avenue or shopping have a total, di totally different experience. Ah, here we go. In 2008, we see a new vehicle uh, show up on the scene for Route 59. Route 59 and 66 and 75 were benefiting from a dual mode trackless trolley vehicle that was introduced. Now, what's a dual mode trackless trolley? Well, it's a trackless trolley, trolley bus, and it has a small diesel engine in the back of the uh, vehicle. And what does that do? It allows the vehicle to operate off wire in the event of a fire or some sort of uh, utility work, and it can it continue uh, to provide service reliably as opposed to having to be bust. So here we are 100 years later, you can see that we have a brand new structure, brand new fleet of cars, brand new fleet of uh, trackless trolleys, and we made it. I thank you. We made it. We, we traveled 100 years in an hour. So before I conclude, I just, I just want to run through a couple of slides of then and now for you guys so you can see how far we've come. So you can see that the fleets changed from 1922 to the new cars today. Lehigh Avenue which is still the same today with the, the bridge span there, but the YMCA for the Reading Company is gone, replaced with a U-Haul facility. And uh, Strathman Lumbers is still there. Up at Bustleton, there's the, the 1922 Bernie car. And today we have uh, dual mode trackless operating out of Bell's Corner. Down at uh, Frankfurt and Arendt, we had the dummy depot that succumbed to the construction of the elevated. And today we have a, a modern accessible facility at called the Eric Transportation Center. And up at Bell's Corner, guess what? Things have changed, but not really. You got a new vehicle, but there's that same, what you call it an Art Deco waiting shelter for the Bell's Corner Loop. And then down on Frankfurt Avenue, look at this small trolley car waiting uh, with the uh, Cedar Hill Cemetery in the background. And today, here's a modern uh, vehicle coming out of uh, Frankfurt Depot down Frankfurt Avenue for uh, Route 3. And there's the Cedar Hill Cemetery in the background. And then finally, up at uh, the city line where they had a stub end terminal, we have a nice brand new loop with dual mode trackless trolley operation. So now I just want to remind everybody, if anybody wants to hear a little bit more or understand a little bit more about the subject matter covered in both the first part uh, part one in December or this particular uh, program tonight, we do have a book available for a donation of $25 to the Historic Society of Frankfurt in the back. And for those online, you can acquire the book uh, from the Historic Society of Frankfurt through this web address. So I thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So um, anybody have a question? You always have a question, Dan. I didn't realize there was an elevated above Delaware Avenue, and according to your presentation, it was pretty short-lived. It, uh, it pretty much paralleled the Frankfurt L. Do they really think it would get that much business along Delaware Avenue? Yes. Yes, actually, because there was no Delaware River Bridge. So if you wanted to go to South Jersey, you had to use the ferries. And the ferry terminals were situated right on Delaware Avenue. So there were, there were two stations built. Uh, one was between the Reading Company Ferry Terminal and the Pennsylvania Railroad Ferry Terminal. One was on Market Street, and the other one was on Chestnut Street. So the stop was right between those two. And then there was a second station down at South Street where additional uh, boat services were available. So yes, that was the most important part of getting down Delaware Avenue. 
Okay, and where did you get your pictures from and does SEPTA have an archive? <laughs> well, I listed the sources of the picture in the beginning, believe it or not. Those are all the different sources that I went to, the Free Library of Philadelphia, uh, the Historic Society of Frankfurt uh, contributed a large part of their collection. Um, City of Philadelphia archives. Um, they were all they were all listed. The Electric City Trolley Museum had a lot of uh, photos that we used in, in this program. Does have, have an archive? Um, I would say they have records. They have records that they've retained for legal purposes or real estate purposes but it's not open to the public for research. Um, we have a, a chat question. Um, what is the difference between a tractor's trackless trolley compared to a bus? Okay. Well, a trackless trolley is an electric vehicle that's powered by overhead uh, wires. Uh, it's usually 600 volts DC, or at least it, it was when they first started. I believe it still is now. Um, and they're limited to the wires up until 2008. Uh, they, could, they couldn't go off wire unless um, you know, there was, they were towed. Uh, so they were constrained by where the wire went and where that's dictated where they could operate. Buses can basically go anywhere. There's a lot of um, discussion now about using electric buses, which would give you both the benefits of an electrically powered vehicle via battery and, and, and a bus vehicle that can go anywhere. Uh, we tried that, uh, except they tried that down in South Philadelphia, and that's being worked out right now. There were some logistical problems with that design. Uh, it is being applied successfully in other places. So hopefully an electric bus will be the answer to that uh, problem of the wires in the future. Alan? You know, yeah, the problem with electric I, I, I buses is like the me. same as with electric cars. Batteries keep catching fire. Uh, so I think that's, so Well, I don't think you're going to see any electric buses for a while. And um, I, anybody, and I'd be very cautious about even electric cars because they still haven't solved the battery fire problem with those either. As far as the uh, the elevated trains, uh, the city is has historically been like the second or third banana behind other cities. I mean, what? what I, I'm assuming New York had the first elevated uh, train service, like for a. Uh, you know, I, I I think that's correct. I know that uh, Boston was a uh, an early adopter of rapid transit, but I think it might have been. Was that before the turn of the century? It could have been because electrically powered vehicles started coming on the scene in the 1890s. But in, in as far as traction goes, and Alan's probably going to chime in here. What, one, but one of the things I want to mention is that even before electric, electricity was applied to move vehicles over elevated rights of way, they used steam engines in many different applications. Well, one other thing, who made the PTC's first 1922. Who made the, the cars, the, the elevator? The JG Brill Company. And where were they located? Southwest Philadelphia. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. they built the uh, 100 car order. Was was Bud still was Bud involved? When did Bud come? Involved? Bud Bud That's wasn't a, building cars at that so. point. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I I have a comment I like to make about the cars. The original Brill cars weighed about 90,000 pounds per car, and the new Bud cars use a lot of aluminum, they got the weight down to 50,000 pounds. And by reducing the weight of the, the trains on the structure, it helped to prolong the life of the structure. So they were able to postpone the reconstruction of the L many, many decades more. That makes perfect sense. Great, Harry? Yes? I have a question. Uh, a friend of mine, we were talking the other night, he grew up right off of Castor Avenue and he wanted to know about how the 59 trolley got on the tracks. Because he said he remembered the 59 trolley when it went down Oxford Avenue, it ended before, right before the L. And then it reversed and went back up. 
and he doesn't remember the tracks being connected to Frankfurt Avenue. So how would the trolleys have gotten on the Castor Avenue or onto the 59 line? Okay, so there's there's been a lot of discussion about the trackage on Oxford Avenue. And Susan's looking at me now because she knows this, this question because we've seen photographs in front of Frankfurt High School and you know, there's only one track there. We know there were two tracks eventually, but uh, the answer is basically they were making track changes to Route 59 throughout its existence. Um, you are correct that the, the terminal that was situated on Oxford Avenue and Frankfurt Avenue, that had to be connected to Frankfurt Avenue, but to go in the northbound direction for depot access. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, I believe you're asking is, well, how did they get into the Arrick Street Terminal? Well, that connection had to be established by 1948 when they created the loop. Mm -hmm. And they might have put the switch in as late as that date, or they might have put it in earlier. But the conjunction, in conjunction with the trackage that was added on Penn Street in 1948, that created the loop. So it didn't go around. Uh, to the south until 1948, as far as I understand, but uh, they needed depot access. So it, they did go to the north. So there's a, a switch to go to the north on Frankfurt Avenue. Does that answer yeah. your question, Joel? Yeah, he thought he thought it ended on Oxford Avenue. That's what he remembered. And, and, and it did. It did end there until at least until 1948. Right, but yeah. the depot... <laughs> The depot access had to be established, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in 1922. Okay, great. Thank you. In uh, the beginning of your program, there was a picture of a horse car on Fall Street. And was that an original car or is it a copy made for like the 100th anniversary of a horse car? I don't really know. I don't know the background of that car. It was restored. Uh, for the 1922 ceremonies for the opening of the L. So I presume it was one of the original cars, but I, I can't vouch for... It was just restored. It could have been, oh yeah, I would at least restored. At least well, restored, if not built new. Yeah, yeah. Who's making the uh, L cars nowadays? Well, nobody domestically. Um, we're, we're, we're now in a, uh, a situation where uh, we have to put requirements in the contract for a certain percentage of domestic participation. I'll put it that way. You can do the final assembly here. You can get components delivered uh, from local uh, uh, manufacturers and then put together in a uh, sub-assembly fleet. But no one's actually building the whole car here uh, from scratch. The bug companies close. Bombardier is closed. There's other foreign companies that are coming in and building cars here, but they're foreign companies. And they're yes, but I just shared I just shared some pictures with my daughter, and it was very interesting because these pictures were taken in Kobe when she was teaching English in Japan. And I never knew that those cars, the Kawasaki cars, were sub-assembly. They were built over there and they must have been brought here worn down and then rebuilt because there is a ship in Kobe with all the Kawasaki cars parked on it. And I never saw that before. I have a chat question here. I'm over here <laughs> uh, reading from the chat box. Um, in, in 2022, the shops were closed inside at Bridge Street, I guess, because of the pandemic. Have they opened now? I didn't recognize the Bridge Street. I guess she was talking about your photos, and I hope it has returned to normal as it was prior to the pandemic. You know, I I don't know. Uh, I I don't know for for sure. I know that there was a dedication uh, ceremony held in the Bridge Street Terminal area, and um, that it was open at that point. But I don't know if it was kept open after the ceremony. So. Uh, I, I think you can call SEPTA's information line if you're um, really geez. interested in going down there and they will be able to tell you if it's open or not. I, I, I kind of think it is, but you, you still should check before you go down. Yeah. 
I just took the L tonight and I don't, I usually take regional rail, but you couldn't get anywhere on regional rail tonight. They had a 55 minute delay at the minimum. Oh my God. So I quickly abandoned the regional rails and took the uh, Frankfurt L, but I don't recall seeing anything open. And I went through because oh. I was with my husband. Did you, it's did you exit bleak. on the, on the Bridge Street, Ed? Yeah. Did it's, you exit? On the, I did. Okay. It's it's pretty bleak. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, yeah. um, I, I got a comment. Are there any plans or proposals to extend the Frankfurt L? <laughs> I think you covered that. After 100 <laughs> years? Well, it's not going to Ron Street uh, anytime soon. Of course, we've all been hearing about the proposed uh, extension of the Broad Street line. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion going back and forth, but anybody who's read today's Philadelphia Inquirer knows that the future of funding for mass transit in general is in question. And we're all looking to the state right now to solve that problem. Uh, Glossep is not in a very good position after this fiscal year that's coming. It's gonna start in uh, fiscal, fiscal year 2024, will be, I believe, the last time that they're funded uh, at, from other sources or existing sources. So it's looming, there's a crisis looming. So talk to your representative about the importance of mass transit and, and make sure that that funding situation gets resolved, if you don't mind. Okay, any more questions here in the audience? I think we're done. There's a lot of compliments and thank yous of great uh, presentation on the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, no, yes. Can I make a comment? Broad Street, uh, the Broad Street subway. Now, I haven't read anything about this. I've just heard this from word of mouth. I'm from South Philly, so I have a lot of friends down there about the extending down into the Navy Yard where they would put two stations down at the Navy Yard, one all the way in and one right at the gate, the main gate there. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, I, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about that, and that's uh, more feasible as a project than um, an extension all the way out into the Northeast, just from a cost standpoint. And of course, you know, the Navy Yard's been uh, developed now. So there's a lot more activity down there than there was when it was a Navy facility. So, um, you know, it's, it's again, it comes down to the capital budget situation. Uh, we are talking tonight, uh, I showed you the air conditioned cars that came in 1999. Uh, there's a project in SEPTA's capital budget to replace those cars already. And, you know, the, the, the regional rail fleet uh, that's running primarily, is, it dates back to 1975. They've got a uh, hundred or so cars uh, in the early 2000s, but the rest of the fleet uh, is starting to be retired because it's reached its uh, useful life. And so that's not even budgeted. And, and then you've got... Uh, Broad Street cars that came in 1978, and they're they're still in great shape. But they're you know in other cities you'll see replacement programs in place for that type of equipment, and that, and thankfully the most exciting thing is the replacement of the Kawasaki cars uh, with a new type vehicle that will be articulated in that capacity. But that's absolutely necessary, and those the Kawasaki cars are not accessible. No argument, but yeah. Uh, uh, Alan, good to... you, you were talking about extending the Broad Street line into the Navy Yard. There was actually discussions to extend it past the Navy Yard underneath the river and run into South Jersey. So you have a direct connection for the South Jersey folks to get to Center City very easily. That, that is a project um, uh, I've heard a lot at, when I was at SEPTA. But you know, now you're talking about. Uh, uh, different states getting involved. And, you know, there is the Delaware River Port Authority, so there might be a funding source mm -hmm. there. But is there uh, really, is there a need for that? Or is it uh, going to be some sort of a light rail line down at Blastboro uh, connecting mm -hmm. at uh, Camden? We yeah, don't you, know. You were also talking about the trolley tracks and the Ben Franklin Bridge. They actually have trolley stations in the anchorages on each side of the bridge. Very elaborate with mosaic murals and history of tracks they never used. And after they got that far into it, when they started laying the track on the bridge, they found out they used a different gauge rail track between Philadelphia and Camden, and they weren't compatible. 
And that's why they never inaugurated that service. Well, actually, they knew that uh, going in. Uh, they knew that there were different gauges, and the plan was for the, the South, South Jersey trolley routes to come across the bridge and operate through a loop station underneath Franklin Square and then go back across the bridge. So they weren't going to try and interchange uh, vehicles with the Philadelphia streetcar system. But uh, right around that time, most of those uh, South Jersey routes were being uh, converted over to bus operation. So the need for trolleys uh, sort of faded away as the bridge came closer to being completed. But you're right, the anchorages were built at that time. And I've been in those, those uh, trolley stations and the, I've seen the elevators that took you down to the street level. It's, it's very hard to get inside that anchorage. I tried it, but it's only open in very limited conditions to a limited number of people. Agreed. It would be Agreed. Fascinating I was there. If they opened it up. I was there for the 75th anniversary, and that's the only way I got in there. That's that's the anniversary I'm talking about. Never got in. The line was too long. Yeah. We have one more question here. Uh, yes. Uh, it's interesting that SEPT is already looking to replace the Mark of Frankfurt cars because they bought them from a company that did a poor job in building them in the first place. They're only 25 years old. No comment. So that's something to consider. And also, uh, the Silver Line of Fives built by Rotem are in a similar classification. In fact, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you could keep the uh, 1975 Silver Line of Fours uh, with decent maintenance. You could probably keep them running for still several years. But, yeah, they're, uh, they're built with a very, uh, very strong car body. That's that's renew, you know, you, you just renew all the components. The car body is fine. But SEPTA in that same article today was uh, talking about uh, savings from reduction in their regional rail car fleet. They started with eight cars, and I believe they're going for another twelve cars or twenty-two cars over the next two years. So their needs for equipment are declining with the ridership because it hasn't come back from COVID. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Harry. Great, you. great presentation, great question and answer. Um, so we'll see everybody on May 3rd for a presentation on the history of Carsdale and the Marlton Inn. Um, and those of you who are here, please join us for refreshments. And if you haven't signed the sign-in sheet, please do so, it's floating around somewhere. Thank you, everybody.